Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, Asmin and I had an awesome chat and uh, yeah, it's really exciting to um, be back virtually with my alma mater to uh, chat with all of you. And yeah, this is, you know, let's make this a really interactive session. Um, I prepared a few slides to kind of outline some of my thoughts, but um, really here to kind of take questions and uh, help you any way I can. Um, okay, let's get started. So, uh, like Asim said, I graduated from the, from the Economics MA program in 2011. I've been working at Hootsuite since 2012. Uh, currently with the, I've always been with the marketing department, currently focused primarily on revenue growth. I also taught at FIC, which was an incredible experience. Happy to talk about that and, 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 uh, and elaborate. And it overlapped with my experience at Hootsuite and, and it was really invaluable uh, to both be a teaching assistant during my MA and then also an economics instructor. It just gave me so many skills that you use in the workplace around uh, explaining concepts, teaching people, being able to simplify problems, uh, abstract problems, uh, very, like it, it was such a rich experience and you just never know where um, rich experiences that help you out later on in life will kind of come from. So you should, you should be open to them. Okay. So my job at Hootsuite, I joined as an intern um, originally, and I think that's quite common for startups. They didn't have much of a budget and there wasn't specifically a role for me, but I had met with them and we had some great conversations and I was teaching at FIC. So financially I was in a position where I could, and I was working at FIC part-time. So both with my time and financially, I was in a position where I could take on um, uh, an internship with Hootsuite. And the, the idea originally was to only work with them for maybe three or six months. And, you know, it just kind of took off. And I think the lesson from that is if you have the opportunity to hop on a quote unquote rocket ship, um, that's often one of the most important things. Your role coming into an organization is rarely, at least for me, and my advice would be, it's rarely the most important determinant. It's usually what's the company, who are you working with? I, um, one of one of my old bosses and, and mentors, um, who was the chief revenue officer at Hootsuite, he had a framework for joining companies, which was, it was kind of a surfing analogy. So he looks at the wave, which is kind of the marketplace that the company's in, the surfboard, which is the product that they're selling, and the surfer, which is the team. And if all three kind of check the box for him um it's it's a company that that he'll you know he, he he'll he'll join essentially um i started at hootsuite very quickly after joining i became the second analyst and i helped scale out our analytics function um the lesson there is it was really right place right time i was just so fortunate that i joined at a level where we were at a scale where we had enough data and it started to become very interesting to use data to inform decisions, both strategic and operational. But also, um, I was fortunate that I, I had uh, an executive team around me and, and leaders and mentors who were very supportive of my growth and very supportive of this type of work. So um, I think I, in large part, I was successful at Hootsuite because I was, it was just the, the right kind of environment and structure that allowed me to succeed. And I still work very, I don't, I'm not an analyst anymore. I don't manage the analytics team anymore, but I still um, informally mentor and coach all the analysts. And so if you have any questions about getting into business analytics, how organizations approach the discipline of data and analytics, um, happy to answer any of those questions. Oh, sorry, next slide. Thanks. Okay, so for the last few years, I've been what I call a pinch hitter, moving around marketing and helping where needed. And this also, I think, ties into my philosophy that I shared earlier about the exact role matters less. And one thing you'll notice um, when you enter the workplace is there are kind of informal and formal structures. And the formal structures are people's actual job descriptions and who reports into who. And then there's kind of a I don't want to call it a shadow structure because that, that makes it seem nefarious, but there is essentially a secondary layer in every organization of how people really work. And um, it's really fascinating and interesting. And one of my pieces of advice is to quickly find out and figure out what the real structure of work is. It's obviously aligned with the org structure 
of the company officially on paper, but they're not always exactly the same. And, and, I, and I think that's very fascinating. And so my role has kind of been moving around um, a little bit within Hutu, which has given me a, a broad range of experience. Uh, I worked in our London office leading our regional growth, which was really interesting. It's where I made the transition from an analyst. So very strategic, working with people, but not owning outcomes to being an operator and working with individual teams on customer facing initiatives and owning a revenue line and a PNL. I managed the go to market for a product we acquired called Adespresso. Uh, it's a standalone product that helps you manage your performance marketing. I helped scale out our bid market sales team and rebuild our uh, sales ops infrastructure, which was a really cool project, very different style of project um, and exposed me to our sales team, very different than our self-serve business, which is where I've spent the most of my time at Hootsuite. And right now I'm currently focused again on our self-serve business, primarily customer retention and also expanding generally a culture of experimentation across the organization. Okay. I think that's enough about me. So that was just a background on myself. Happy to talk about my experience um, and to dive into anything that I, I touched on earlier in the call. Uh, the next few slides I think are really interesting. You know, after I had my prep session with Asm, I think the big takeaway and what I think all of you are looking for on this call are essentially kind of more practical tips and, and kind of a real world approach to uh, outside of academia, post-academia, uh, how to be successful in the workplace, whether it's the private sector, government, or nonprofit, I think this all applies. Okay, so the first thing, um, you know, is kind of knowing your strengths and what to lean on. I think all of you are in the economics program, whether it's um, MA or undergrad, and the biggest thing, this is, uh, this is not sanctioned by the economics department. I don't know if they agree with the first bullet point. It's definitely how I think about it is, unless you're becoming a, an actual economist, uh, economics is more like a philosophy degree. And I mean that in the sense of it really teaches you how to think. And you see a lot of people with philosophy degrees go on to be exceptional lawyers and other kind of disciplines because they have very strong, rigorous thinking and mental models. And similarly with economics, you really get trained on these very powerful mental models that are extremely helpful, um, whether it's, again, in the private sector, nonprofit, or government, very powerful way to think through things. The other long-term trend, um, which is really interesting, it's not a new thing, it's something that's always existed and, and there, um, you know, you can find old texts from even the 20s that start to talk about quantitative marketing, but companies as a whole are becoming a lot more quantitative than historically. This is, again, it's a long-term trend, pre-World War II, post-World War II, but it's just something that's kind of had a new step function change with the digitization of work, um, allows us to collect more data points and also allows us the easy access and analysis of data points, which is really kind of the, the uh, enabling technology that really has changed the culture of a lot of organizations. And so you have a very strong quantitative background and it, I'm, I really see it every day in the workplace, people with a very strong quantitative background, whether it's engineering or economics or computer science, uh, they all have something different to bring to the table, but having a quantitative background now is only going to become more important and being able to think critically only becomes more important, especially as business becomes more dynamic and people change careers and change roles and organizations very quickly um, in a short span of years. It's very important to have those first two bullet points, which kind of brings me to my third bullet point, which is when I joined Hootsuite, I really didn't know anything. I didn't even know what business analytics was. I knew very little about digital marketing. However, because I had a strong foundation, um, I was able to learn fast. And um, even leapfrog people who maybe didn't have the same foundation as me, but had a lot of subject matter expertise. And so the combination, I think, of very strong first principles thinking, especially quantitative first principles thinking, and just honestly, just lots of reading and learning. So you have to be able to quickly absorb a lot of information, which especially in the MA program, um, I think you, you also get trained in that respect, which is really powerful. Um, you know, I was able to very quickly get up to speed and very quickly add value to the organization. Okay. The next one, and so every slide is going to be like a completely different, um, there's going to be a lot of context switching. So every slide is like a totally different uh, outlook, I think, on how to be uh, successful. The, so the first I, one, 
Sorry, yeah. can, I, can I interrupt right there? <clears throat> Just before you get on to your second, um, uh, your point number two, could you define what business analytics is with an example with what you do at Hootsuite? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think in the, the simplest way is it's anything that utilizes quantitative, but sometimes even qualitative information. And um, really it's anything you can count or measure. So it can be as simple as revenue forecasting. So saying we've been growing 10% and we expect to grow 10% um, based on current trends. And that is X amount of revenue and this is our cost and so on and so forth. Or it, it, there's really like, let me start over. I think it's a really good question. I think there are different levels of depth. I think at the most basic, it's being able to count and measure things and being able to contextualize them and uh, explain them to people. I think where it really gets interesting is having strong mental models to help people understand what really drives the business. And so the example would be a good example of where an analyst can add a lot of value is saying, we want to offer a 50% discount to customers. And we think that if we offer a 50% discount, more people will come in through the door and buy our product. And you can see where I'm going with that because one of the first things you learn um, is um, the elasticity of demand. One of the questions is, does the increase in demand outweigh the foregone revenue from the discount? And so if you give a 50% discount and you can triple your sales, that's a very attractive uh, strategy. If you give a 50% discount to all customers and you only increase your sales by 10%, you're actually uh, hurting your ability to generate revenue. And so it's really helping people think through problems. And often, um, this is my last anecdote on this one, but I had a, I had a VP who once asked me when we were going into annual planning, like how many analysts should we have? And I think for other functions, it's easier to understand how many you should have of something based on very real physical um, limitations. So a good example is a sales team is a function of how many uh, prospects they can talk to and you have a sales funnel, which is also an analytical problem. So analysts help you work through a problem like that where you understand a salesperson can only talk to 10 people at a time uh, with a 50% success rate. So if we want to close 500 customers, you know, you work through that funnel and you just, you know, determine what the size of your sales team needs to be and how many leads you need to generate. But when she asked me how many analysts we should have, the question was essentially like, how deep do you want to go with your analysis? So we've built a ton of automated dashboards that measure the business revenue coming in, number of people starting to use the product, leaving, converting to paying customers, et cetera. And if all you want to do is measure how the business is doing, you really only need maybe one analyst at most to just maintain those dashboards and make sure nothing breaks. Now, if you want to understand why a certain number has gone up or down, that's a difficult question. And then if you want to start running experiments or thinking more deeply and more strategically about how to grow the business and what the trade-offs are, you, as you ask more and more involved questions, the difficulty of that answering that question increases. And so it's really using data to help inform decisions because it's one of the few functions in an organization that doesn't actually generate value. It generates value indirectly. And so technically you can run a business without any business analysts. You'll just be forced to use your gut most of the time. And occasionally you can use heuristics and rules of thumb around kind of rough data. But you know, it's very, it's very, very, most businesses are run without business analysts. It's, it's a function that generally only exists in larger organizations. It's a great question. I, I hope I answered it. Yeah, absolutely. And so basically, um, the bigger, bigger, the larger business grows, the more need for analysts. Absolutely. More or less. Yes. That's great. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, point number two, this one really, I think is, is um, gets away a little bit from the world of academia, which up until now is largely, um, you know, it's, it's, there are very clear um, me measures of merit. You know, you write an exam, you get answers right or wrong. You get, um, you know, a, a result on your exam that helps you apply to the next program or, or allows you to pass the class, et cetera. But, you know, once you enter kind of the professional field, a lot of it is, based on these weak links that you have pe with people, weak ties. And so 
being lucky in your career is largely a, I like to think of it as a probabilistic game. And so it's how many times at that plus your on-base percentage, which is a function of, are you, you know, well-versed in the subject matter? Do people tend to like you? Do you have good relationships with people? And just putting yourself out there because it's impossible um, uh, beforehand to know where your opportunities, especially where your fruitful opportunities will come from. And so um, I tend to look at career opportunities as something that can come from literally anywhere. And one thing, especially if you have a long enough career, people who report into you at some point will get into a position where they can even hire you. And so you don't really know who, who will have a good or a bad career trajectory. So my general golden rule is to be as generous as possible you know, kind of always, of course, with healthy boundaries without expecting anything in return. I think that's also important. You don't want to, you know, kind of in a mafia-esque way, you know, have this like informal, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But the idea is if you've helped enough people along the way, when you need help, it, it will materialize and kind of that's the concept of karma. And so, you know, a really good example of just putting yourself out there and putting yourself in a number of different situations where opportunities can arise is, um, I moved into a place in Kits on my upstairs neighbors. I was living in the, in the, in the basement unit uh, during grad school or part of a dodgeball team, which they invited me to. I met a ton of people there. And then some people from that dodgeball team were friends with people on a soccer team, which I also then joined. Many of us from the dodgeball team joined the soccer team. And from there, I met someone who was working at Hootsuite and at the time thought nothing of it. And then I think a year later, even after she had left the soccer team, I think I reached out and asked if they were hiring at Hootsuite and she put me in touch with some people and there was an open house and that's really how I first got my foot in the door and um it's a it's it's a very kind of uh uh you know normal sort of uninteresting example kind of by design because most opportunities come from very mundane places and I think that's what's so interesting about that example is it's not exceptional by any means I think by you know, helping people out. And it's what people typically call networking, but I think a lot of networking sometimes feels forced. I think it's just being out there in society and engaging with people and doing side projects or working with nonprofits or um, helping tutor people or whatever, you know, like they're all opportunities to create connections. And then once you start working, you build more connections. And that's often why the hardest part of any career is often getting started and joining an industry. Once you start to meet people and know people, it, it, I, you know, I can guarantee you it gets a lot easier um, to find opportunities. Okay, which brings me to my next point, which is your resume itself is just a co collection of good stories. And this speaks to kind of the yin and yang of, especially a lot of you are very quantitative, but people often can interpret the world and understand it and make their decisions about events or people generally through stories. And so often I find that people with the strongest resumes have really a collection of five or six really strong stories. That's, that's a ballpark that's kind of a made up number, but the idea is there are things that a recruiter will see on a resume and think it's interesting enough to call you. It's something that once you get interviewed on, they will be interested enough to wanna to ask you follow-up questions. And one example I like to give is my MA project, which again, speaking about being lucky, like it's just putting yourself out there and doing things. I never pursued my MA project with the goal of having something interesting on my resume at the time. I think it was mostly, I thought it was a very cool thing to do and I didn't really know what I wanted to do after grad school. So it, it seemed like a very easy fit to do the MA project, but it was on gentrification, which is, you know, a very, um, I think it's, it, it's a topic that's fascinated a lot of people from my generation for the last, you know, uh, decade or two. And so I just kind of found throughout my experience, having put it almost um, as an afterthought on my resume that people love to ask me questions about it. They love to talk about it more than my actual MA degree or other professional experience. It's just, it seems to be a thing that resonates with people, but also it's very tangible and it's something that everyone can have an opinion on and they love to ask questions and say like, what do you think about Vancouver and is it gentrifying quickly and is it not? And you know, what do you think about this? And it's really like, 
if you think about any um, interview process, it's essentially trying to get to know a candidate and, and, and trying to understand if they're going to be good in the role and if you're going to enjoy working with them. And so that's really the role that stories play. Is there a jump off point for that person to get to know you better? Um, and so as you get more experience, you're just going to cycle out some of your weaker stories and cycle in some of your more interesting stories. And that's why when people ask, like, when is the time you overcame a challenge or when is the time you made a mistake or et cetera, like they're all essentially stories. And so having a good, you know, collection of stories that you can use and of course, customize to the, to the audience um, is going to serve you very well in your career. And so putting yourself in positions where you can start to collect good stories. And again, it's probabilistic. Most of the stuff you'll do will not result in a good story, but if you do 30 things, you may get five good stories out of that. And then just small tips on your resume, you know, try to limit your resume to one page, making it easy to scan and your cover letter should add details and information that is not already on your resume. Um, and this really speaks to like thinking about your audience and thinking that someone has to read and scan through often a hundred resumes over the course of a couple of hours. And so the ones that are easiest to scan, they just have a huge leg up. That's it, just such an unfair advantage over the ones that are very difficult to read. And having read thousands and thousands of resumes, literally, I can, I can guarantee you that it's, it's a huge leg up. Okay. Happy to also take questions as I'm going through this, by the way. Um, communication. So this, this is another point I think that's so important when you're working with people is being able to be clear, but also engaging in your communication is going to serve you incredibly well. Um, people who can tell a simple and engaging story have such an incredible advantage in being able to share their perspective. And often a lot of working in a company is multiple people sharing their perspective and engaging in dialogue and coming to some sort of consensus. And so, and then the other piece I'll add is, um, you know, like most decision making, whether it's again, nonprofit, government, private sector doesn't really matter. Uh, there's a lot of decision making under uncertainty. And so no one has the full story. It's, it's one of the things, you know, academia has this as well with research to a certain extent, but generally the stuff that makes it to the, to the peer review level is like, it's very, very well researched and you have quite strong data so you can really lean on it. Often the types of decisions you have to make day to day operationally in the professional sector you have very little data to go on. You have a certain amount, but a lot of it is your mental model, the assumptions you're going in, and it's kind of a almost a flipped 80-20 rule. You have maybe 20% of the data and 80% is gonna be assumptions and mental model and a little bit of guessing and, and calculated risks. And so being able to clearly articulate that, be very action-oriented with your insights that you're presenting um, and making it very easy for the audience to consume that information is only gonna serve you well. And then the last piece is having a good relationship with your audience. Remembering that there are humans on the other side and essentially, you know, if they want to fixate on the flaws of your reasoning, they can. And if they wanna fixate on the really strong parts of your argument, they can as well. And often the differentiator will be their relationship to you and their relationship to the problem. The best example is giving bad news. If someone does not want to learn that their initiative was not successful or not profitable, they will be able to find flaws in your work. And so you want to create an environment where they're very open to receiving that feedback. And so that's why, you know, being able to, to clearly and objectively communicate, but in a way that's also very engaging, um, is it's, it's an incredible soft skill that, especially paired with the quantitative background, um, is, is really powerful. Okay, this is a fun one, especially for economics majors. Um, but I often find that like most of the interpersonal challenges that exist within organizations are due to a lack of alignment of incentives. And so, um, you know, I think there's like the Coase theorem about, you know, you have a firm because the, the communication costs are lower. One of the interesting other, you know, things about, you know, kind of theory of the firm is you essentially have hundreds of micro agents who all have their own incentives, whether it's to get promoted or for their project to succeed or um, for their department to get bigger, so on and so forth. And so often a lot of the friction 
is either a difference in philosophy or a different in uh, a difference in you know perspective or, or worldview. But really, the one that you can impact the most is the alignment of incentives because that allows for cooperation. And I believe is kind of a, a first principles base. The more an organization can cooperate internally, the better the outcomes for the customer, for the company, for the you know the, the, the shareholders, for everybody involved. Um, and so this this is this is really powerful to think through what is the other side thinking and what are their incentives? Um, and this helps for not only getting projects done, but also for your own career growth. I think this is something that a lot of people, one of the biggest mistakes I see when people think about their career growth is they think too much about themselves. Um, I think it's maybe the idea that like, if they don't think about themselves, no one will, which I think is fair, but you have to remember that the people making decisions about your you know promotions or getting put on certain projects or whatever they have their own incentives and so if you can align your own personal development incentives with those of the company that's really the fastest path i'll give you an example you know everyone wants to move up and and get seniority and be put on big projects but that's a huge risk for the person that's delegating the project to you so the more that you can show that they would be well served to put the project in your portfolio or give you responsibility over a certain functional area or a department that it would help their outcomes, whether it's, you know, they own a revenue line and they know that you're the best person to increase their revenue or you're the best person to make a project successful or you get along really well with these, you know, stakeholders that they need to work with. That's really going to make that decision very easy for them. Um, and then in terms of the getting projects done, a great example is kind of, you know, this is kind of a nerdy example, but we think about this a lot at Hootsuite around digital marketing attribution. So we have all this data about customer touch points with our paid marketing programs and organic and the website and et cetera. And they are all being measured based on performance. And it, remember, there are individual actors who are also trying to increase their budgets, get promoted, get, you know, make their departments bigger, et cetera. And one of the things I tell people about the attribution of efforts, so if we have a thousand trials, or signups, where do they come from? Is a customer often has multiple touch points with multiple channels. And so if you make them compete, they will no longer want to cooperate because the paid media team will not want to send traffic to the website, for example. They will want to have people convert directly on the paid landing page. And that could work, but also it could be too early in the customer journey. And so, how can you design the attribution model so that? they're not penalized for cooperating with another channel, which would generate a better outcome for the organization. And that's, that's something we, we solved at Hootsuite where we modify the attribution such that the web team and the paid team had, a, had an incentive to cooperate and they weren't actually stealing conversions from each other. Okay. So, uh, this, what, Mohammed, yeah. I've got to, so what was the team incentive then? To, to make that, a, that, a, that, that, that model work. Totally, so there are a few different attribution models. One is a last touch, so, you, so it's the last recorded touch gets the attribution. And so if, if we had done something like that, what would happen is that all of the paid clicks that then went to the website to convert would be counted as web conversions and not paid conversions, which would make the paid budget look very bad. So what we did is we said, anyone who clicked on an ad, we gave them, a, I think, a 30-day window to convert, and regardless of where they converted, on a paid or web channel, um, i.e. organic, they counted towards the paid media team. And the web team, which tends to be the terminal point where most people convert, was incentivized to work with all the channels, you know, social media, paid, et cetera, because they got attribution for any conversions into trials. And you give up a little bit of accuracy when you do a model like that, but then you have a web team that really is invested in supporting, because it's our biggest channel, it's really invested in supporting all of the other channels that drive traffic to the website, but then the, tr the channels that drive traffic to the website are very incentivized to optimize for whatever is the best flow from a conversion perspective and not what is the best flow from a attribution perspective. Perfect, thank you. Okay, this is the, uh, you know, if you Google the T-shaped model of competency, it's something I really like. 
Uh, and it's something I think I see a lot in the workplace. You often have people who are jacks of all trade uh, and master of none. This is dangerous because those people tend to underestimate the depth or complexity of a function. So a great example is they'll go to a graphic designer and tell them to change the color or something. So they're like, oh, I think you should change the color on this. I think you should make this, move this over here, et cetera. They don't appreciate that there's a lot of thought that went into that design. But, but And then the flip side of that is people who who are singularly focused underestimate the importance. So they may say like, oh, it doesn't matter what the design even looks like um, because uh, all that matters is, you know, the, the targeting. If you're on the paid media team, is like all that matters is we target the right customers and then it doesn't matter what the ad says or what it looks like or whatever. And I think with the T-shaped model, you have enough, enough depth in your own function that you know what it looks like to be shallow and what it looks like to be deep. So you have that context. So like, I know that I know a fair bit about analytics, for example, and I know very little about design or about programming. So I know enough that I can interact with those teams, but I also know enough to know that I'm not very deep technically. So if someone is explaining to me why it would be very difficult to build a solution in the product, you know, I'm going to really respect that decision and be able to work with them um, in a very easy manner because I know that they're very deep on their topic. And so I, I have a lot of um, appreciation for that. And then the other thing is a lot of interesting ideas come from these intersections, which again goes back to my first point about, you know, putting yourself out there. This, this is kind of what, there's a lot of literature right now about one of the big losses of the virtual workplace, I think there's some good stuff, some bad stuff, but one of the big losses of the virtual workplace is you no longer have uh, hallway conversations or water cooler conversations. And often some of the best ideas come from when people from different departments run into each other um, and they just have a very casual conversation and they develop a solution uh, that would be very difficult to develop in isolation. Um, and so in a virtual workplace that, that doesn't happen anymore because people are just on their computer screens and working with the people they work closest with. And I really like this Steve Jobs quote because it speaks to one of the things Apple did especially well in the early days is they had an appreciation for the visual aspects, the design aspects of the user interface experience that people who are pure programmers just didn't care about. And so a concept, you know, I think you see this, you see like the type of, it's almost become a, a parodied at this point, but the types, the typefaces that existed in computers were very geeky up until kind of the mid eighties when Apple started releasing its first compu uh, personal computers with, with graphical user interfaces. And that's in part, at least the myth is that it's because Steve Jobs, you know, uh, attended this, this calligraphy course and he developed, um, you know, a, um, uh, an appreciation for for typography. I think there was a question I'll take. Can you speak yeah. to the data and analytics team at Hootsuite? Yeah, for sure. So we have a data engineering team and what they do is they uh, do essentially what's called ETL, so extract, transform, load, which sounds simple, but it's an enormous amount of effort to uh, uh, instrument and capture all the data points and often it's in a um, raw or unstructured format so you know be, uh, you know there's a ton of different ones I think you know like JSON's one of them and, and and basically it's just like lots and lots of text essentially huge you know multiple gigabytes or even terabytes of data and then they will structure it in a way um, with various levels of abstraction that analysts can then use and um, uh, essentially query using a more structured language like SQL. So we have a data engineering team, which which is like really heavy, like it's, it's an engineering team first and foremost, data second. So they work on our data infrastructure, all of the tools that capture the data and the tools that need to be fed data. Like we, you know, we use Tableau for data visualization, we use Amazon Redshift to store all of our data, so on and so forth. So they own all of that. And then we have analytics teams kind of spread out throughout the company now that are focused on different functional areas. So we have product analysts, we have sales analysts, we have uh, self-serve slash digital marketing analysts, we have 
pure enterprise marketing analysts. We even have one HR analyst, um, uh, which is cool. So, I mean, you can really apply analytics to any function. I think as the point is really interesting that as the organization gets larger, you will get more and more specialized analysts. So I think the the who tweet specific thing and what you see with a lot of organizations is if you're a really small organization, like let's say under 10 people, you have no analysts. The analyst is everybody in the company with whatever data they can somehow collect and trying to make good decisions. And then if you get to 100 or 200 people, you start to have one or two analysts and they will just kind of answer the most pressing analytical questions in the company. As you get larger, you will have even functional areas with dedicated analysts. And then you can get to a certain size where even projects can have their own analysts. So if you were to go on and work at like a Facebook or Google or a um, you know, Procter and Gamble, like individual products or even individual products and their individual markets. So for example, Clorox in North America, specifically the retail sector, you know, specifically even Walmart will have its own analyst because it's such a big problem from a revenue perspective that it deserves its own analyst. So, so the, at Hootsuite, we're kind of somewhere in the middle. We have more than one analyst. We don't necessarily always have the level of depth that individual problems have their own allocated analysts for individual teams, but we do have kind of a kind of a semi-distributed analytics team as well as a, a full data engineering team that supports that team. Did that? I hope that answered the question. Yeah, great, okay. awesome. Yeah. Do we have time for? Can we uh, uh, answer another question, Mohammed? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, what is the development projection for data and analytics team uh, at Hootsuite? Will they have a data scientist at some points? Well, oh, that's a good question. We already have a couple of data scientists. Um, I think the de definition of data scientist versus analyst is kind of a gray area just in the industry. Um, whoever asked that question, can they, when they say da data scientist, I assume they mean someone who's heavier in programming, typically working with, with big data sets and doing a lot more of their own data processing. Um, in that sense, we, we do have data scientists um, and we are engaging in machine, some light machine learning, um, but we don't have a full data science team like uh, Facebook or Google would have where you have like 10, 20, 50 data scientists who are developing like the Facebook or the Google algorithm. Um, that's, that's not an area where we're at yet um or even necessarily would, would ever be at that level so so yes we have people who uh are more on the computer science side i, I typically tend to think of data scientists as just people who are a bit more on the computer science side and typically are more self-serve with uh unstructured data sets but but if um uh if um the person who asked the question has a more pointed question about data science. I think I can answer that as well. If they'd like to okay. elaborate, well, we, we can go on. Oh, no, it's good. It's good. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Right. Great. Okay. On to the next one. I think is the last one. Okay. So this is a fun one. So, and it's really to take pressure off. I think a lot of people, especially when you're younger, you think that, being original or being creative means inventing something that no one has ever thought of before. The honest truth is that creativity is really just combining things. Some people call this stealing. It's not really stealing. It's there's appropriation. So there's not crediting your sources and plagiarism, which is a, a certain type, but often most things that you find are very creative are often what someone did is they had multiple sources of inspiration and they were able to, combine them in a way that's very creative and you know is just different enough that it can either make you see things in a new light or it's uh fresh it's a fresh perspective or it's different enough that it, it it kind of energizes you if it's a piece of art or music or or uh or you know any or whatever um and so i really like this quote from the french filmmaker um it's not where you take things from it's where you take them to um and I think when it applies to your career, it's it's like that that's a that's a big kind of philosophy of mine, especially as you do work. You know, often you are taking pieces and you're trying to solve problems in new and innovative ways, but it's never from a vacuum. So thinking about how, you know, 
applying first principles thinking, but also thinking, how have other people solved this problem? And trying to reverse engineer how they've done it to understand the parts of the solution you agree with and the parts of the solution that you don't agree with. Okay, I think those were all of my slides and then just happy to take questions now. Thank you, Mohamed. I mean, at this point, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but uh, if you have uh, some questions that you'd like to either put on chat or we can unmute your mic, uh, please let us know. And you just have to let us know that you have a question. Oh, we have one. About data analyst roles at Hootsuite, do they run statistical tests or more towards uh, let me just say and get that. Uh, do they run statistical tests or? Hello, Azam? Yeah, I think Azam got cut off. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. Do you want to read I, that? I, I read the question. Um, it's, it, 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 it's another great question. It really depends on the problem being solved. We do a lot of what we call A-B testing, which is a statistical test where we, you know, have a treatment and a control and we see the change in outcomes for the uh, treatment group, but we do a ton of descriptive or summary statistics and, and they really play different roles. I think the summary statistics play a role of understanding is the business moving in the direction that you expect. So we do a lot of that because you're just kind of, you know, it's, it's like growing a plant and you're kind of checking on it every day. You're like, does it look brown? Is it growing? Is the soil dry? Do the roots seem healthy, et cetera? That's a lot of summary statistics because you know we want to make sure that you know the, the business is growing and is healthy uh we also do a lot of descriptive statistics just to kind of inform our statistical tests so we'll kind of take a look and we'll say like hmm like most of the plants are quite dry around this time of year so like what could we do to improve that and that's where the statistical tests come from is like is it a fertilizer problem is it a watering problem is it that they get too much sun is it that the you know, greenhouse is too dry, so we need to open up the windows or, or vice versa or close them because the moisture is being let out. And so those, were, those would be the experiments. So it's, think of it more as a cycle because one informs kind of the other. Oh, thank you, Zia. Yes, ab absolutely. Just to, to echo Zia's point, like, um, especially I think what's difficult this is something we talk about all the time at Hootsuite is, um, uh, and, and it's good to see people talk about this more because it has implications with, you know, diversity and inclusion and giving people equal opportunities and, and especially with, with uh, underrepresented groups. But a lot of people don't feel confident applying for roles where they, they're not 100% qualified. And you should always know that generally the hiring manager is kind of creating their ideal profile of what the perfect candidate would look like and it's very rare that it, someone applying knows all of those things um and so if you satisfy even 70 to 80 percent of the criteria um uh, that's usually good enough to apply that's that's my advice there uh justine yes please please un unmute hi um so my question is at the beginning of your uh, presentation you said that uh, a lot of your growth came from the fact that you were in good places of growth and you had good mentors. So my question is, how do you know whether or not you have good mentors or you're in a good place of growth where you're being given the proper, the right opportunity? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, hmm, how do you know you're in a good place? Um, you know what, I, it, it's an interesting question because it's a bit of a, um, um, it's, it's an, I, I think the term, if I'm recalling, it's like, it's a bit of an endogenous problem where part of it absolutely is, uh, there are external variables. Like some people are just more helpful than others, to be honest. And, and if you're in a company where revenues are declining, it's very hard to have career growth versus a company that's growing and hiring people and giving people new opportunities. Um, so that's the first one is, is, Part of it is putting yourself in a place, if you can, where those opportunities exist. And generally in high growth organizations, they, they tend to exist more than in low growth or negative growth organizations. But also I think where the 
endogenous aspect comes from is the, the point I tried to make about aligning your incentives and also being generous. And so people who, people want to help people who have been helped by someone. And so I think the more generous you are, the more generous people will be towards you. And I think the other thing is um, trying to think a little bit critically with your manager and also your boss's boss is about how can you align, align your incentives with theirs. So if you know that their primary focus is for a certain initiative to be successful or to hit a certain target or improve a certain aspect of the business, if you can come up with ways to do that, that's much more interesting than things that you would come up with that are even at odds or, or um, tangential to what they've determined is a, is a focus. Now that, that being said, the caveat, which is why I think a lot of my advice often seems contradictory is like, you shouldn't always just follow kind of leadership blindly. Like I often do challenge, uh, you know, my, my boss and my boss's boss, et cetera. But often it's really coming from a place where I, I understand what the true North is. And I just disagree perhaps with how a problem has been interpreted or framed and what they think is the best way to get there. And so we're going to get to the same place, but I may propose maybe like a different way, which, you know, it's just another perspective It's not to say that I'm right or I'm wrong, but when I do challenge, it's always trying to level up a bit and be like, okay, like I know this is the overarching goal. I just don't agree that if we do this thing, we'll get there. I think that there's a better way to get there. Great, thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, okay, experimentation culture at Hootsuite. Yes, um, I think it's something that's very well developed in some parts of the org and still in its infancy, which is exciting in other parts of the org. So I would say there isn't an experimentation culture at Hootsuite, but the, some teams, in particular the growth team where I work, has a very strong experimentation culture. And uh, I mean, really, it's just like I was just kind of telling Justine, it's having a clear true north, so a very clear mental model about the world that's, you know, kind of grounded in first principles, and then you just, you test your hypotheses. So if we want to have lots of successful customers, you know, we will ask, well, where do they get hung up? And then we will maybe do some surveys. Maybe we will analyze product data. Maybe we will interview customers. Maybe we'll, um, uh, you know, just work, work through some of the workflows in the product ourselves. And then we'll come up with a bunch of hypotheses and we'll say, well, you know, we think that the, you know, act, for example, of connecting a social network is very challenging. So what if we did it in a different way, again, based on first principles kind of thinking, like we think that it's really hard to do it this way, but we think this way kind of makes more sense is more intuitive. So if we changed it to this, would we see more people successfully connect their social networks, right? And you're trying to just break a problem down into small problems and slowly iterate. And we just apply that in various parts of the product and the website experience. And it's, it's, I mean, the key to an experimentation culture really is, is having the cycle of insights, hypothesis, test, collect data, iterate to your next hypothesis. Most experiments fail. So the other aspect is just having a good cadence and saying, we're going to test something new every two weeks, for example, and we're going to try to just slowly make progress on this problem. You know, I, I think that um, it, we have an interesting group here because we have some undergrads here, we have some MAs, and I know we have uh, at least a couple of PhD students in here. Uh, okay. Who uh, one particularly uh, who's in you know in in uh, experimentation, uh, experimental economics. So uh, oh, cool. I think part of my question would be: Is there a capacity for all levels of uh, degree holders in 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 a huge in a huge sweep? Like, is having a PhD too academic, or is is having an undergrad well you just don't you're not trained well enough um what's your what's your opinion on that Mohammed? oh that's such a great question uh, of course the answer is yes but you, obviously you want me to elaborate on it so yes of course there there there's a there's a there's a place for every level i would say um the most interesting is probably the phd one so that's the one i think i'm going to address i think at the ma level uh and the, the undergrad level it's it's fairly um I think intuitive uh, what their career growth with. I think for at the PhD level, I think what's interesting is you have such a, a specialized um, type of knowledge 
that the biggest challenge I see for a PhD is almost uh, dumbing down. And, and, I, and the, I say that in the sense of like, there's this meme you've probably seen that goes around when I think of some of the like consulting meme pages and stuff about how like the most challenging math you do is I think like in high school or undergrad and then it kind of gets dumber from there. And then you're kind of doing like grade eight math when you're back in the professional world. So it's like a graph of like the complexity of the math you do. I think for a PhD, it, it looks different because it like keeps going up, up to the PhD and then it drops off sharply. And so what's challenging about working in the professional environment is it, de it depends on the role. So I think certain types of machine learning, et cetera, very specialized roles in, in, in organizations, you, you really do use that PhD knowledge. But I think what's challenging about being in a professional environment is you mostly work on dumb problems. You're just working on a hundred at the same time. So instead of working on a really difficult problem um, for like 40, 50 hours a week, you work on a hundred fairly simple problems but concurrently and with all of the other distractions of people's interpersonal conflicts and motivation and budgetary constraints and you know the timing doesn't work because these projects require the same resources and there are dependencies. And so it's a lot of juggling. And so that's actually what's challenging about being in a professional sector. And so how can you use all of your brain power and your awesome learnings from your PhD to lots of simple discrete problems versus one big, I think, theoretical problem, which is often kind of how the, the, the PhD work is framed because your audience doesn't have a lot of patience in the, in the whether it's, again, private, nonprofit, or government, they often don't really have a lot of patience about going 10,000 feet deep into one small problem. They actually t tend to prefer, in order to have progress, to like make lots of progress on a, on a wide class of problems that have to be um, solved by the organization at any given moment. I don't know if that's helpful, if that kind of makes sense. It does make sense. Um, just because um, I'm, I'm, you know, from my perspective, I'm working with all three and um, with our undergrads, they feel the challenge of trying to uh, impress employers with things that they, with perceptions of not knowing enough, and with our PhD mm -hmm. students, and even our, to a certain extent, our MA students, it's like, okay, I don't want employers to be intimidated and um, mm -hmm. turned off by me because I have a PhD, um, you know, and, and think that the work that's being presented or these jobs are not challenging enough, right? Because there's many, many different reasons why a person does their PhD. And um, um, so any advice on, 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 you know, trying to, <laughs> uh communicate that type of you know uh flexibility in their you know mm -hmm. their, you know what i mean totally i think for the undergrads what you really want to show is that you're coachable and you're a fast learner and you're passionate because if the hiring manager and the recruiter are good which i would i hope they are they already know you don't know a lot like when you're coming in entry level you're not expected to have the subject matter expertise. So, so what people are really looking for is, can this person be coached? Can they quickly learn both by themselves and if someone teaches them? And are they passionate so that they have the, what you really have to offer at first is your energy and your enthusiasm. Later in your career, what you have to offer is your experience. But early in your career, what you really have to offer is uh, just kind of like, ener like pure power. Like just the fact that you can, you know, do a hundred of these small little tasks and be really happy to do them. And then when you're more experienced, it's, oh, this person has solved this problem a hundred times. So we're really looking to them for, for their guidance on this. At the other end of the spectrum around the, the PhD MA level, I think it's being able to show that you can think through complex problems you very easily. Um, and that's a huge asset to any organization. And you know, I think it's having the self-awareness that you know that the nature of PhD work is very different than the nature of work in an organization. And that's okay. And you want to use your brain power to be able to solve difficult, complex strategic problems good in a good enough way, and then be able to quickly move on to the next one. Because I think the biggest thing that employers are actually worried about with PhDs is that they will 
try to like keep going deeper and deeper and deeper on a problem when often in the in the professional world outside of academia of course there are always caveats because there are things in the professional world where you have to go super deep and there are specific roles and that role is literally all they do is they go deep on a problem whether it's you know clinical research or if you're on the ai team at facebook so there are absolutely roles where your whole job is to go deep and not do anything else but most roles i think they'd be applying for in the professional world they want you to be able to self judge to say i can go 80 percent on this problem in 10 hours it would take me 10 weeks to go 100 percent on the problem but 80 percent is good enough that i can have a solution and that's what i meant earlier about kind of the making decision under uncertainty is it's often called by, you know, kind of, especially like non-analysts called like analysis paralysis, which I don't like because people use it all the time, but it is a real thing where people say like, well, we don't know because we still need to look at this one thing. And then you look at that one thing and you're like, well, that brought up two interesting questions to look at this. And then you're like, well, this brought up three questions, which we still want to look into to be 100% sure about this thing. And usually in the professional sector, you want someone who can judge and be like, here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. Here are my assumptions to deal with the stuff that I don't know. And I don't think that it's such a big deal that we can't move forward with this decision, which has these risks and we're going to measure for them. And we know that we have a rollback plan. So if this idea doesn't work, it's very easy to course correct. And like, that's the ideal solution someone is looking for in um, the professional sector, which is very different than how you would approach uh, a, like a PhD dissertation or a, or a peer reviewed uh, paper. That, that is a fantastic guess. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, so listen, we, we're at eight, 128, right? Uh, uh, Mohammed, uh, do you mind sticking around for a little while longer? Yeah. Just to answer sure. some more questions. Uh, if there's, for those of you who have to go, go. Um, but I have a few other questions personally that I'd like to ask uh, that I think would be relevant to you guys. But please, uh, if any of you have other questions, please go ahead and ask. Uh, either through the chat or uh, we can unmute. I think you can unmute your mics uh, to do that right now. Do you mind if I ask? <laughs> do you mind if I ask another question? I've, I got a couple more. Yeah, um, please. This is in particular, I, you know, you're, you're, you're a senior person over at Hootsuite right now. And um, you know, there's a lot of people who'd want to uh, sort of connect with you and I'm sure you, you speak to, uh, prospective uh, employees. You know, one thing that I've always grappled with, Mohammed, is how does a person who connects with you or anyone else show their appreciation? Um, you know, do they, you know, they don't want to inundate you with emails, they don't want to inundate you with messages on LinkedIn, they don't, you know, what kind of, because uh, I know you've been in that situation as well. Uh, mm -hmm. What's an appropriate uh, sort of response or give back to to people who help you out in your network oh that's that's a really good question um i think the best way to reach out is to be very specific um i think it depends right like if, if you have someone who can intro you I, i'm just going to be very frank about this because everyone is looking for actionable advice if you can be intro to someone you get away with a lot more than if it's a totally cold ask that from someone you've never heard of before and so when someone reaches out to me who i know and says like hey i have a friend or my cousin or my brother or my sister or my nephew or whatever is interested about learning more about x can you spend some time with them i always say yes because i'm doing it as a favor for that person if it's a cold call it's difficult to devote your time to someone you've never met with before who has like kind of a vague idea they're like Oh, you work at Hootsuite. I just want to like know more about tech. And so if you're doing a cold ask, it should generally be very specific to say like, Hey, I think you can help me with this very specific question I have that can always lead to other conversations, but it's like I have a very specific question and showing that person that you've done your research. And so if it's something that's easy to Google, often the person that you're asking will be a little bit less interested or less have less of a motivation to help you because it kind of shows that like you didn't even really take the time to google it um like one i often get which is kind of the obvious one is people are like hey is who's hiring for this position and the 
I never say this, but the, but the honest answer is like, well, there's like a, a, a careers page where, <laughs> which actually knows more about the problem than me. So are you asking me to go to the careers page and Google it? And so it's like, however, you know, sometimes people have very specific questions that only I can answer. And then, and then it's a bit easier to answer that. And like, and I apply that, you know, I feel comfortable giving that advice because if I ask something of someone that I've never met before, I, I try to follow those rules as well, because I know that people's time is very valuable and, and you never know on the other end, how many requests that person is getting of their time. Is that? Yeah, is that, that, that is question? fantastic. Again, for anyone that has to leave now, uh, uh, please do so. And thank you very much for attending this. This has been uh, mm -hmm. immeasurable for me, it really has. Um, awesome. Awesome. But I do have, I do, I'm going to continue and I'm going to ask a couple more questions if you don't mind, Mohammed. Um, yeah, so uh, we had mentioned that, I don't think you mentioned this, but you were an international student. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a pressure on our international students, especially for those who are, uh, um, you know, doing their MA and, and, and our MA students especially have one year, uh, um, you know, uh, for the postgrad work permit, they have one year. Uh, to get you know to get a job and things like that and so um, uh, any advice <laughs> uh, in terms of you know not panicking or you know best approaches or you know, how did you do it how did you manage that stress um, I mean I think you just you have to work backwards from kind of a realistic timeline knowing that it's going to take you probably three to six months to find something um, especially in the current you know, I, I don't know in the current economic climate how long it takes, but in general, it takes you three to six months to find something. So I think that's why they give you a year um, is you shouldn't be stressed. And I think very similar to the, the uh, there was a great, you know, the, the great question earlier about the experimentation culture. It's about making a little bit of progress every day. So applying, you know, following up with people who have re responded to you, checking job searches. Um, and so it, think of it as a funnel, right? Like you have to apply to 100 places to get, uh, you know, 15 phone screens to get five interviews to hopefully get one role, right? So you're working back from a funnel. I think keeping your options open. So the worst thing to do is to be too focused early on because then you lose time. You want to be fairly broad with your initial experience, even if it's not exactly what you're looking for. It's better than nothing. And then once you have a job, once you're in an industry, it's easy. So one of the big mistakes I, I have seen people make is to say, I'm only looking to work with this type of company in this type of role. And it's really hard. Like you waste a lot of time doing that. It's better to say, I'm interested in these areas. Any role in these areas is interesting. I'll do whatever, because you just want to get into an organization. Once you're in an organization, it's very, very easy to get the role that you want versus waiting out until you that magic kind of like ideal role kind of comes up. Um, and then the last thing is kind of just, you know, really doing your research and trying to look for unconventional ways to be introduced or get opportunities. And if you know anyone, you know, one of the best ways is to be referred by someone like that's such a huge, huge, you know, honestly, that's probably the biggest cheat code is if you're applying anywhere, the first thing you should check for is if you know someone in that company, a, to do recon to understand what they're looking for, um, what the culture is like, what types of candidates they tend to go after. But also, if they can put in a good word for you, it's a huge advantage with any recruiting team because, you know, all of you have studied information asymmetry. And that's one of the big reasons referrals are so powerful is it doesn't eliminate, but it definitely uh, mitigates an enormous part of the information asymmetry problem of hiring. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, so just that's just a, a, a sort of a an obvious call out to join Simon Fraser Economics LinkedIn. What a plug, right? Um, it's a must. It's an absolute must for everyone to be a part of that. If you're not already, um, we have uh, Mohammed, who is part of that our, our group, uh, and and many many others like him. So I mean, that's just an absolute must. Um, my, 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 my quick question here, and I think this is going to be relevant to everyone here. Um, the tech industry in Vancouver obviously is, is, is there and it's growing and it's getting bigger. Um, are there any industry events uh, or get-togethers or meetings that, that are must-go-tos for, for our students 
uh, in your your mind, Muhammad, that that will allow them to meet people like yourself? That's a good question. I would say, especially if you're coming from an economics background, especially if you're looking to do analytics, look for like the really nerdy ones. I say that you know with 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 only love in my heart, but as as you know, being also like a a, a big nerd myself. But it's like like there's one that's called like Tableau User Group, and so it's specifically about Tableau, the product, and a lot of analysts in Vancouver are part of that group. So I think the more specialized the the group, the the better and richer the connections you'll have. And especially if it's something where you can add value, you know, especially with your strong quantitative, that if it's something where you can add value, that's that's you're just gonna really be appreciated in that group and that'll create interesting connections. So I would say be more niche and and look for places where you can add value to that group uh that's that's the one that immediately comes to mind but there's probably like a ton there's probably like analytics groups and a data science thing and you know blah 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 etc like those are i think really those are probably the best groups i mean now with COVID, it's tough because people don't really meet in person so a lot of the stuff is virtual um but yeah that, that that's the one that comes to mind for sure Perfect. And I'm just going to point people to uh, just go to Eventbrite as well. Uh, you'll you'll mm-hmm. see things that are just advertised on Eventbrite. And you might find something that's interesting. Yes. Uh, you know, you know, I always say, and, and Mohammed will agree, just go to stuff. You know, I'm mean, you're, you're coming to this. You're going to learn something. I mean, uh, as you said in, I think, slide two or three, Mohammed, uh, you know, you're not, you're, you're assimilating information, right? And making your own. So I'm going to assimilate some of your information from these slides and put them in my career workshop uh, for Great. sure, because I thought, I think they're very useful. Uh, but at the, on that note, um, I think I'm going to um, bring this to an end, unless there's any other questions. What I, what I do encourage everyone to do is, listen, um, I don't think, I'm not going to speak for you, Mohammed. I, I think you can eloquently connect with him on LinkedIn if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're shy, you can go through me. Uh, But I think uh, I know that you have some great advice um, to to give some some of these students, uh, especially our PhDs, hint, hint. Um, And so um, we really appreciate it. Uh, This was terrific. I mean, I not only enjoyed our prep, but I enjoyed this as well. And, you know, as I said before, I could go on for a couple of hours here. But um, with that, uh, I want to thank you very much, Mohammed. I want to thank Carmen very much because she put together these slides and was an excellent back end. Yeah, and I agree from Shelly. Thank you for the fantastic presentation. I uh, gave a lot of well-informed advice and opinion basis. Thank you for organizing us and, and, and Carmen. Thanks. So everyone, uh, we're going to come, uh, we're going to come to an end. If you have questions for me, you guys know where to get in touch with me. Uh, and, uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, there are some upcoming events, uh, next week. Um, there's an RBC uh, virtual tour, uh, and I'm um, sure there's a couple of others that I can't even think of right now, but uh, we're done for today. Mohammed, thank you very much again. Carmen, thank you very, okay, very thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Bye, everyone.